He was born in Japan to less than thrilled parents. They just didn't have high hopes for Pac-Man. Nobody had high hopes for Pac-Man. Yet the little yellow dot enchanted a nation. For the second time in history, the Japanese mint had to start making more 100 yen pieces. And the world. Pac-Man is part of a national phenomenon that had to happen when the TV set married the computer. His popularity caused worldwide havoc. There was an American reaction to it, and it was a big reaction. And it was a very angry reaction. Hear the story of his birth. Nakamura-san was afraid that Americans would alter the P on Pac-Man, so he changed it to Pac-Man. His defeat. I had such a tight grip over the joystick at times, I was afraid I was going to shatter it, but I managed to cheat death. And how he captured our hearts. This is the story of Pac-Man. Back in the early 80s, every town would have a recreational center. There would be pinball games, pool tables, shuffleboard, air hockey, foosball, and then maybe a video game or two. And most people didn't bother to go to the recreation centers in their town until some of the more modern games started coming out. Video games have been out there since about 1972, but they really had no major impact on the public. But all that is about to change with the birth of Pong, a video game that paves the way for the golden age of arcades to officially begin. What you see here is part of a national phenomenon, a phenomenon that had to happen when the TV set married the computer. Space Invaders was like the first game in this three-game progression that brought the public completely into the arcades and made them become enamored with video game playing. Space Invaders had initiated the wave and the excitement in arcades in both Japan and the United States. And right after Space Invaders, Asteroids came out, and Asteroids suddenly had further enhanced gameplay where people could get very high scores and also got the competition going for people playing against each other in a bigger way than Space Invaders started for high score laurels. Video games are everywhere. Everybody wanted to go, everybody wanted to play, everybody wanted to be the best. It starts with a quarter. By 1979, the American craze for video games is just beginning. They seem to have captured America's imagination and its pocket change as well. But on the other side of the world, a young Japanese game designer named Toru Iwatani is inventing something new, something that will change video games forever. Iwatani-san is a very interesting fellow. He came to Namco, he wanted to make video games, arcade games, based on pinball. He wanted to make a game that would appeal to women. He wanted to make a game that would be non-violent. And he wanted to make a game using the word tabaru, which was to eat. Namco's president likes the premise. Iwatani is assigned a team of nine designers to help bring his vision to life. Bear in mind, back then, hardware was pretty limited. You could get shapes and colors, but they couldn't be very detailed. But he, he started the game, and one of the first things they ran into was, what does this character look like? When I interviewed Iwatani-san, he talked about going to a pizza parlor with his designers. They were eating a piece of pizza. Somebody pulled a slice out. And he looked down at the tray, and there was Pac-Man staring at him. Fact? Or fiction? You make the call. 
interestingly though, in an interview he gave the year Pac-Man came out, he said that he would have liked to have said that he went to a pizza parlor and was inspired by pizza. So take it any way you want to take it. It's a great legend and the industry needs its legends, right? After months of development and location testing, Pac-Man is ready for market. But he takes a back seat to a more conventional game. They made Pac-Man at the same time they made another game called Rally X. And absolutely everybody at Namco loved Rally X. So then they took the games to a Tokyo game show. And everybody at the show loved Rally X. The main thing wasn't that people didn't like Pac-Man. They just didn't have high hopes for Pac-Man. Nobody had high hopes for Pac-Man. Despite the low hopes, Namco still finds an American distributor. They hooked up here with Midway Games. Midway was going to import both games. They took both games to an AMA show. Everyone loved Rally X still. Pac-Man was good. Rally X was the game of the show. And then they came out and... Well, when's the last time you played Rally X? In 1980, Pac-Man is released in Japan and instantly develops a feverish following. Pac-Man was a hit right off the bat. It was an immediate success in Japan. For the second time in history, the Japanese Mint had to start uh, making more 100 yen pieces because so many 100 yen pieces were sitting in the bellies of Pac-Man machines at that time. It had genuinely fascinating and invigorating gameplay so that it could become addictive to the person because it would really lead them into this incredible trial and error process of learning the game, memorizing patterns, or getting to developing your eye-hand coordination, your motor responses, so that you could defeat the game and have a high score. In Japan, the success of Pac-Man leads to some unexpected career changes. Around Tokyo, you'll see lots of vegetable stores. There are mom and pop stores, they're all over Tokyo. These people stopped ordering vegetables, cleared out their stores. They'd buy maybe 10 Pac-Man machines, and they'd make a lot of money off of it. Now, it's time to release the game in America. Well, with one major exception. It was originally going to be Pac-Man, uh, based on the shape. And Nakamura-san was afraid that Americans with their quote-unquote proclivities towards uh, dirty words would alter the P on Pac-Man, and so he changed it to Pac-Man. With the new name in place, the Bally Midway Company releases Pac-Man in October 1980 to a hungry American market. Pac-Man Mania. Pac-Man is known as the cute game. What's the object? You have to clear the... Yes, you have to get all the, all the dots off. Yellow creature gobbles dots while being pursued through maze by monsters. In October 1980, Pac-Man is released in U.S. arcades, and America catches the fever. Oh, I played Pac-Man the moment it arrived at um, a 7-Eleven just outside of Burley, Idaho. When Pac-Man came out, it caused everybody to fall in love with video games. biggest arcade game of all time, by a long shot, the biggest arcade game of all time. In the United States, it caught on. You'd go into any large arcade by mid to late 1980, and you'd see an entire row of Pac-Man machines. And manufacturers have trouble keeping up with the demand. In suburban Franklin Park, you'll find Midway Manufacturing feverishly turning out 350 Pac-Man games every day in three different cabinet styles. 
Remember, we're talking about 1980. We're talking about the beginning of MTV. People are still fascinated. They're fascinated with technology. They're fascinated with video, bright images, music, and the future. Pac-Man brought more people in. People went to arcades specifically looking for Pac-Man. The little yellow guy becomes the media's biggest star. Believe it or not, Pac-Man games are wildly successful. Pac-Man finds himself in some very strange places. They pop up everywhere. I mean, you know, 7-Elevens would carry them. Grocery stores are carrying them. The funny one is that at least one funeral home had a couple of arcade machines in its basement. Pac-Man was so good that it managed to escape the arcade and be a unique item for entertainment that could be found any place, not just an arcade. It was an incredible phenomenon at, at that time. Suddenly, everyone wants a piece of the Pac-Man pie. Pac-Man was the granddaddy in marketing history of gaming property. Pac-Man was the one that made it onto everybody's bed sheets, their pillowcases, their underwear. Pac-Man is everywhere. There are Pac-Man cartoons, there's a Pac-Man cereal, Pac-Man lunchboxes, Pac-Man board games. Things they wear on their wrists, things they wear around their neck, things they wear on their feet. Pac-Man trash cans, Pac-Man toilet seat. Just anything you can imagine. Pac-Man is there. Pac-Man was really the beginning of all that for the video game industry. Now, it's not unique anymore because everything seems to be doing that now, but they're just following the path that was trailblazed by Pac-Man 20-some years ago. Love for Pac-Man knows no boundaries. Women loved Pac-Man, and they came into the arcades to play it. <laughs> But Pac-Man causes mayhem among parents, and he finds himself on the wrong side of the law. Look at the age group that was being attracted to arcades. You know, it was a new hangout. There was concern about how much time children were playing at the arcades, that they were squandering their lunch monies at arcades. We're talking about in 1981, Americans dropped 20 billion quarters into arcade machines. They spent 75,000 man years playing arcade games in 1981. That's a lot of time that could have been used doing homework, a lot of time that could have been used in movie theaters according to Hollywood, a lot of time that should have been used listening to music according to the record companies. People in all kinds of industries looked at it as a very unhealthy competition. Pac-Man becomes the poster child for the anti-video game movement. Pac-Man really was at the forefront because it was the most popular and it was an image that everyone knew. Everyone knew the little yellow ball. Clearly that was the focal point. And it was so much press. Everybody who wanted to control and regulate and limit video game play, well then it becomes sort of a renegade thing. You're a renegade if you play it, if you buck the system. You make all the older people mad or you annoy them or you do what they're telling you you shouldn't be doing. There were big court cases where arcades were limited in the hours they could open and where they could be located. There was an American reaction to it and it was a big reaction and it was a very angry reaction. But the protests do little to reduce the fever. In fact, Pac-Mania is just beginning. Pac-Man had a very long lifespan. In 1981, Pac-Man was competing with Donkey Kong. But before it was competing with Centipede, and it was competing with Battlezone. I mean, Pac-Man had just these long, long legs. Pac-Man was hot right up until Ms. Pac-Man came and eclipsed it. Ms. Pac-Man is released in January 1982 but the game is created by college students, not Toru Iwatani, the creator of Pac-Man. Ms. Pac-Man's a great story. Namco had nothing to do with the creation whatsoever. 
a team of MIT grad students develop an add-on board, which they attach to an existing Pac-Man board to enhance the game. They went to Midway and they said, we've got this Pac-Man add-on, would you like to buy it? And the president of Midway basically said, hey, you know, we've been looking for a sequel to Pac-Man. So they bought that add-on and they added it to Pac-Man. All they need now is a name. So originally they were going to call it Mrs. Pac-Man, but somebody said that Mrs. Pac-Man was offensive to women. So then they were going to call it Pac-Woman. But the problem was, in the cutscenes, she is a baby. And, you know, heaven forbid we show any Pac-Man promiscuity. So, a very politically correct Ms. Pac-Man is ready for the arcades. Upon release, she immediately outperforms her predecessor, selling over 115,000 units. But her fame is short-lived. By mid-1982, the arcade craze fades as fast as it grew. Inevitably, there was a shakeout, and the number of arcades that were existing in America at that time, which numbered maybe about 20,000, which was a lot. It was an arcade in every town, essentially. Then it shook out so that there were only about 12,000 left, and then it shook out more, and there were only about 4,000 left. The Pac-Man family alone isn't enough to save the ailing arcade business. Games become unpopular when people get very good with them. You see, Pac-Man is one of the greatest games, and the reason it's one of the greatest games is because it's also one of the hardest games. Players who become adept at it know that there are patterns. And so now all of a sudden, instead of people playing for 30 seconds, now you have people who can come in, they'll drop a quarter in, and they'll play for an hour, or they'll play for two hours, or they'll play until they're just bored and go home. And that all of a sudden makes the arcade business extremely expensive. By this time, the public's attention has already shifted to another technological boom. In the spring of 1982, home versions of popular arcade games are flooding the market. I'd like an Atari 2600 system, please, and everything that goes with everything. You sure want everything? I want everything. Arcade knockoffs did not have to be especially good or especially attractive. They needed to have decent gameplay, and they needed to have the name of the arcade game right on them. But can home consoles save Pac-Man from extinction? In April 1982, anticipation rises for Atari's version of Pac-Man for the VCS. Here comes Pac-Man, biggest game in the history of arcades. People are really excited. The pre-orders are huge. Atari is so sure that this is going to be a hit that they made more copies of Pac-Man than there were active VCSs in people's homes because people would play it, and this would be a huge hit. But the game stunk. Oh, the game really, really stunk. The ghosts keep on appearing and disappearing. They didn't move smoothly. Pac-Man didn't move smoothly. The, the mazes were not the same mazes that you saw in the arcade game. The dots were replaced with dashes. There was just nothing right in it. Despite the lackluster graphics, the public loves having Pac-Man in their homes. And Ms. Pac-Man follows closely behind. This Ms. plays only on the Atari 5200 Super System. Now you're talking! Attempting to cash in, competitors release their own versions of Pac-Man. There were all kinds of knockoffs. So what these companies have to do is these companies have to create something that's very Pac-Man-esque. And so you have all kinds of games that look like Pac-Man. Odyssey, video game fun. The most notorious case of flattery is Magnavox's KC Munchkin game for the Odyssey. 
Atari takes Magnavox to court and wins. Meanwhile, Pac-Man's legitimate relatives continue to flood arcades. There's Junior Pac-Man, Baby Pac-Man, Super Pac-Man. There are all kinds of Pac-Mans. But all the Pac-Man spin-offs in the world can't save the arcade business. By the mid-1980s, the quarters stopped flowing. The golden age of video arcades is over. Yet Pac-Man still has his loyal fans. Over the past 20 years, Pac-Man has been released on virtually every system. And the desire for high scores never wanes. In 1999, Pac-Man finally meets his match. Billy Mitchell becomes the first person to play the perfect game. I'd say, yeah, people think I'm nuts. You have to be a little nutty to be this obsessive about something. On July 3rd, 1999, Mitchell, the president of a Florida hot sauce company, walks into New Hampshire's Fun Spot Arcade and slides a quarter into the Pac-Man machine. such a tight grip over the joystick at times, I was afraid I was going to shatter it. It was for sure the most difficult thing. Six hours later, Mitchell manages to eat every dot, every ghost, and clear 256 screens. He actually beats the game. Six hours isn't really any big deal. I could easily do 12 hours. But what about those necessary breaks? You know, when nature calls. The fact is, there's several places where you can hide them in where you can take a break. There's places where you can hide them for up to 20 minutes. There's one place you can hide them indefinitely. It took a very high degree of knowledge of the game. When you get to the final stage, the game is different. There's invisible dots. There's dots that are there that you don't get points for. There's dots that are not there that you get points for. The record-breaking feat makes Mitchell somewhat of a celebrity. If I was looking for one to gain fame from, then I picked the right one. If I'm traveling someplace and if I'm traveling with Billy Mitchell, it's interesting to, to see the reaction that the public gives him. He has this unique persona and people notice that, even when they don't know that he's Billy Mitchell, the world-famous Pac-Man player. Is he too old to be playing Pac-Man? Maybe. Am I too old to be doing what I do? Probably. For the young? or the young at heart. Pac-Man is still evolving and still a blast to play. There are very few game characters from the early 80s who are still active in today's gaming scene. Pac-Man would be the, probably the main one. Pac-Man is engraved in that gaming psyche. Pac-Man did leave an indelible mark on 20th century culture, and especially late 20th century culture. And Pac-Man continues to enchant gamers worldwide with his latest adventure. For Namco, Pac-Man is still very much alive. It's a sign that everything has gone full circle, and now the original games are being recognized and given their due once again, but in a new way. There will always be the people who are going to think about Robotron 2084, or Defender, or Donkey Kong. But the biggest group will be thinking about Pac-Man when they think about arcades in the early 80s.